Hi, I'm Todd Gannon, and this is the SciArc Channel. I'm here today with Neil Denari, principal of Neil M. Denari Architects in Los Angeles, former director of SciArc. Neil, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for having me, Todd. So we've been sitting down with the former directors of the school, really to talk more about how the school has positioned itself over the years. You oversaw some pretty exciting transitions. You were the orchestrator of the move from Marina del Rey downtown. Mm -hmm. So that was a time when the school was, uh, what well, you were in the tent for a little while. Yes. So the accommodations were yes. rustic. Yes. That was also a moment where the school was kind of shifting its attitude toward technology. So yes. very soon after you came in as the director, the school launched its website. The paperless studio, I think, came online the next year. Talk a little bit about the context of that transition back in 97. The transition from paper to I wouldn't say paper to completely to the digital world, but it was time. The school's craft heritage was, you know, so strong. The the issue of the physical project and making and so forth. And and I particularly came to the digital with the same mindset. It wasn't that I was interested in shifting completely this whole trajectory that the school, the mm -hmm. DYI nature of the school itself, the nature of practice, which is you go build um, fearlessly at any scale. But of course, at some level, the school had to be a, a school that was going to contend with the most advanced schools in Columbia, had already set the bar very high. And I taught at Columbia in 95 during the first year of their paperless studio. Mm -hmm. So I was well aware you know, of the resources. But the odd thing was there wasn't a lot of teaching going on that was connecting to the technologies. They, always thought that technology had a life of its own then and in a way it did with the kids who were the most advanced software learners and that was the same thing at SciArc but the co-mingling of people like Coy and Robert and even even Tom, Tom Main, who had you know forged such strong identities through drawing and image making, yeah. wasn't that there was any resistance it was that the pockets of, um, let's say, quick adoption were maybe smaller at the beginning than the rest of the schools. Because the school did certainly have that kind of uh, make-it-yourself yeah. attitude. And the students, I mean, what were, what were they like in terms of taking on some I think they new... represented the agendas of the faculty to a certain extent. Some, you could say, were less interested in the in the newness of the tools you know that it hadn't been tried yet yeah. then of course the issue of newness and novelty at all costs was very powerful you know for some you know yeah. for some faculty for some students myself uh, Carl Chu uh, uh, who went in a completely different direction and who's a former faculty member here were pushing the agenda you know rather rather hard and it was one convenient time in which paradigms and tools really created combustible forms of uh, conversation. It's certainly not that way now. In many respects, the issue of what the school was going to become, its curriculum and its identity, was changing and in some ways up for grabs. It obviously took off you know, after that, and it wasn't simply because of me, it was because of timing. How much of a conversation was there between, say, SciArc and Columbia, or uh, some of the other schools that were kind of early adopters of mm -hmm. technology? I wouldn't say at that time there was a lot. People in LA, Greg Lynn had moved to LA and he was teaching the paperless studio. Of course, he went directly to UCLA. Right. Once Tom and Morphosis and John Enright saw the uh, power and the, and the possibilities of technology, I would say Morphosis ramped up rather quickly. They made that transition around 99, 2000. So that would have been right around the time that Cyark was making yes. that transition. Yes. What was that like in the studios? I mean, at a certain point, drafting tables get monitors on top of them. And like, how did it change the culture of mm -hmm. making? It did, because at one level, the software itself was fairly lethal, meaning uh, you had to find discipline in it, and you couldn't just operate off of defaults, because defaults would give you a default project. We saw some of that at Columbia, whether it was in image making or form making, primarily about um, curvature and the blob, et cetera, which was such a... Um, kind of a wild novelty at some level that technique took on the terms of content. And I would say that technique wasn't strong enough yet during that time for it to supplant content uh, or become content on its own. So the conceptual drivers that had been you know, pushing the school were 
were still there. And to a certain extent, I, I can remember going and critiquing students' work, but whether it was on the screen or they printed out something, compared to what it is now, it was relatively primitive. Um, and there wasn't a professionalization uh, or the attempt to professionalize it in any way. There was the kind of older maker generation who were still very yeah. uh, vocal yeah. and active in the school, still are. Yeah. Uh, but then there were also people like Michael Speaks who came in with you or... A year later. Soon after. Yeah. Because Yves Fernelius was here at the time, Margaret Crawford. Yeah. Those are three characters who uh, I think were pursuing conversations. Certainly Margaret with uh, her role in the everyday urbanism yeah. conversation. How much of a presence did that have in, in SciArc? That presence was still relatively strong, but if I were to really parse it pretty fine, I would say that its apex was around 94, 95, let's say particularly with Margaret. But I would say it in relation to what happened with the digital, which pushed a lot of other agendas up. We weren't doing digital urbanism. Right. We were just making digital artifacts. And so conversations on urbanism, Michael Speaks and his big soft orange project and, and coming from a sort of Dutch socialist idea, how that would work in America, Margaret's idea. That was just taking on a parallel discourse. I see. I actually wondered how it could be integrated and I was always interested in trying to force the issue of how that agenda would meet an architectural agenda. They maybe just through natural tendencies wanted to... Stay a little bit yeah, further. Yeah, to separate. Kazis's interest in infrastructure yeah. seems like it could have been a kind of thread that would work through both conversations interestingly. I think it could have, and in some ways it did, but they were also a formal agenda. Certainly Margaret's was. Margaret's was a self-organizing event-based idea of urbanism, and Kazis's ideas bordered on the idea of, I remember his thesis student doing something on Muzak, and the concept of Muzak as a cultural device which is everywhere all the time but not noticeable. A kind of Brian Eno idea of, of infrastructure. So they were aformal projects that could be written or maybe photographed in terms of urban sonography but not hard, hard to design. And so all of this is going on and you're over at Beethoven right? and the idea to relocate yeah. somehow makes its way to the table. What drove that? Yeah, to be precise, the project of relocating was told to me that my very first day on the job, in fact. <laughs> so the conversation we were just having about what was going on at the school was, you know, the foreground and what was happening in the background was I had begun the task, uh, you know, with the board to search for a new home and it was very much the threshold. It was a very bright line between uh, that was then, and the future is going to be about becoming solvent and doing everything to get to the point where you are today. It began then. It probably in fits and starts might have begun a little bit before because I know there were conversations to buy the building at Beethoven, but they weren't planned out so strategically. The board, they saw it as a moment to be able to say, well, we're going we're gonna to make this administration be responsible for making that happen. That foreground background distinction. How you set up a situation where the foreground is staying exciting and current and engaging the field in, you know, the right ways or in interesting ways. And at the same time, the kind of very, uh, you know, the less flashy but arguably yeah. more pressing work of keeping the place. Yeah going yeah. financially and institutionally. When the move happened, how did you hold that together? I mean, because, you know, like packing up that whole place, moving it over here, the building had no windows, and, mm -hmm. you know, that, that must have been a very kind of cowboy maneuver. Well, it was fitting for SciArc. It was challenging, obviously, on a physical and logistical level to move from a place that was really accommodating uh, Beethoven. The parking lot, the building was really well-designed, you know, it was a big shed, obviously. Being able to just pull it off logistically, you know, was part of it, but I think managing the spirit was the most challenging thing, because on the one hand, it was disruptive and upsetting. Mm -hmm. You can imagine that, because everybody who was at the school at that time 
had to say I'm part of an adventure. It was a changing time, I think, among students who said, I like Cyarch's renegade spirit, but you know, I'd like to know that I'm gonna have these accommodations and these facilities, right. these faculty and so forth. And it was it was not easy uh, you know, to keep that together, just looking back on it historically. Making that transition to from an institute to an institution that has a kind of firmer financial and yeah. uh, basically corporate grounding. Yeah. It took the school a while to, to it did. figure that out. It did. Moving downtown became inevitable because of the cost of land. Well, the school was always a west side school. It was a Venice Beach annex for those offices, for the identity of the program, all under the sun and the, and the shadow and the silhouettes of palm trees and all of that. And that's certainly part of the allure that I even felt from the media through the 80s. Oh, and it changed sure. immediately. Definitely that kind of, uh, the sci -arc of the 70s, Venice Beach and those architects kind of grew up in tandem. There must have been some resistance to leave home mm -hmm. in a way, mm -hmm. particularly since downtown was not what that's it is right. today. That's right. How did you handle those conversations? Well, we thought about the valley, we thought about San Pedro and what would it do to the identity of the school and how desperate were we to find any project, any venue. Downtown, I think, became, I mean, economy forced our hand at yeah. that time. By default, the school had to become a somewhat early adopter of downtown. That's the way things work out, even if you don't have a visionary plan to say, we're going to be the ones to you know, be on the frontier. But once it became clear that that was the place to go, then everybody adopted the, well, of course we're going downtown. Yeah. Of course we're gonna be the biggest, uh, most influential institution on the culture side. So, you know, you take on that kind of hubris, yeah. which at this school is not hard to do. No, not at all. I think that's, that's one of the things that makes it go. And one of the things that makes it so lovable and frustrating and all the other things yeah. that it is. But now it would be very easy to say, well, you know, we saw it before anyone else. And yeah. so we went down there, like we knew. Yeah. So it took, what, about a year to fully move? We were on the site August of 2000. We left Beethoven and made like a two month transition, pitched the tents and the trailers. And then it was um, another year and uh, a semester, so let's say 15 months. So the renovation was going on when everyone was in the, yeah. in the tents. And yeah. I would assume, you know, having something like this going on at that time would be a really great resource for the students to kind of watch it go in and go together. I can remember taking students through looking at the steel of the mezzanines and kind of talking about that and telling stories of what happened when we demoed the foundations and found nothing. And <laughs> You go, how did a concrete building from 1906 survive? And yeah. shocking. So With no dirt under it. Yeah. And so we moved into the building? January of 2002. And then that's when I left. You've stayed very close friends with the school yeah. since. So maybe just to kind of close out, you could talk about what, what it's been like since you left to kind of watch the school grow mm -hmm. and watch that seed that got planted with this building mm -hmm. develop. I'd say that SciArg never ceases to amaze. Um, just when you think maybe it's reached a new level and things will settle down or the school will you know, find a, a level of satisfaction, I think that it continues to push its uh, original mission, whether it's, as Eric put it, to find the new or make it new or make it different or make it autonomous or make it unique. I mean, that has that never gone away. And I think that the, just like building an office, you know, you start out and you don't know what you're doing. And then at a certain point, you know what you do, know how to do something. And then your project is not to become professional even when you are. Right. And uh, that, I think, has been very consistent about SciArc. This was a lot of fun, Neil. Thanks very much for stopping by. Thanks, um, Todd. I look forward to having more conversations. We'll see you soon.